good to see so many people. I'd like to welcome our guest speaker today, Sarah Grenant. Uh, she's a former parent in Camden and a pleasure teaching one of her daughters. So that's five years ago. Oh, God. More, more than we care to remember. Um, and uh, she is mainly a novelist, would that be right to say? Yeah. Mainly. Um, but does all sorts of other writing and teaching. And um, she's also very much an expert on the Renaissance period and art. And um, that's what she's going to talk about today. So thank you for coming, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Church, which will be decorated, right? 
And what you start to see now is because they know how to show you the human body and human beings, that although all the stories are still there, they're starting to shift in what they look like. So this is from very, this is the 1420s, the very catchy chapel. And you can see, look, here's the religious miracle going on. But look at these people, they've got real faces. Look at this. This is actually contemporary Florence you're looking at. So Christ may have lived and died in Galilee, but now you're setting the religious images <coughs> in the moment that you're actually living in. Um, and you're starting to see that the people in this i.e. not necessarily the religious figures, but the people in this are starting to look really real. All of these images I'm showing you now come from churches in Florence and they're dated up for about 1430, 1440. So you look at these people and you think, I bet the artists knew them. They've certainly studied them, they may have met them, and you can feel that they've got a life behind them. Look at this one. Now they're all obviously extras. What they're looking at is they're a spectator's crowd on the journey of the Magi, which is happening over there. But just in case you've got any problem with who might have painted the painting, it's this guy. And he's got his name written on his hat. Um, it's not just the painters. If you go to these figures, I showed you this earlier, this little group here would have been recognized by anybody who had any culture as some of the major thinkers of the Italian Renaissance at this moment in time in Florence. So you've got the equivalent of a sort of newspaper with images going out when you enter any church and you're sitting there looking at images of God. And sometimes they absolutely kind of wipe out the stars of the show. So this is an early nativity by Botticelli. And here, of course, is the baby of the smallest thing here. You can barely see it, right? There's Joseph tired after the ordeal of him there. But who's this geezer with his hand on the foot of Christ? This is Piero de' Medici, who was running the city at that period of time, right? And if you look to the left and you look to the right, what you have is Lorenzo de' Medici, his son, who would become Lorenzo the Magnificent, and you have an early self portrait of Monticello himself. Okay? So all of this is absolutely fantastic, except for one slight problem which you may as well have noticed, is they're all men, okay? And here comes Camden School for Girls. I am in Florence, uh, and I have been researching and looking with the idea of writing a novel about how it would be that the shock of the new was what we were living through in the 1480s and 1490s. Wouldn't that be a great way of bringing the Renaissance alive? And my daughters come out to join me, and they are 14 and 11. So they're both Camden girls, okay? And um, I take them out to the main square at the beginning of the day and I say, oh, what a day you're going to have. I'm going to take you to museums and churches and art galleries and I'm going to tell you and you're going to learn about this incredible cultural people out of the cell, I think, right? And the 14-year-old, who has a reputation that I'm going to be attitude on a stick, turns to me and says the now immortal words, I think you should know Mom, that at this time in my life, I don't do culture, I just do shopping. <laughs> <laughs> and the 11 year old, whose job is to get on my sister's nose, says, oh, that sounds really interesting, I'll come with you. And as I started to walk through the streets, I thought, oh my God, I have a really hard sell on my hands. Because absolutely everything I'm going to show them has a man's name attached to it. All the thinkers, all the artists, all the politicians, all the religious figures, they're all men. And I started to ask myself, what, so did women have a renaissance? What was it like to be a woman in this incredible cultural explosion of time? And that sent me back into history, which had been my first love. And of course, in the time that I've been away, Feminism had got its hands on history and had asked exactly the same question, where are the bloody women? And it had done quite a lot of work to investigate what life would have been like for you if you were female during the Renaissance. So first of all, I go looking, directly looking at the images that help me here. And I found two in Florence. Here is the first one. It's in a church in Santa Maria Novella 
It's the huge fresco on the wall of the life of the Virgin Mary. And what you basically have here is, is homes and gardens fashion of the 1480s, which is when it was painted. Okay? That's what the palace would look like, that's what they would have worn, and everybody in it is a woman. And that's highly unusual, but the reason they're all women, of course, is because it's childbirth. And that is profoundly still a female experience at this moment. And then in another chapel, I showed you one picture from it, I found this. Now this is a tiny little figure in the Brancacci Chapel. You have to really look to discover it. And she's gold dust, if you're a historian, right? Because she's not famous, she's not wealthy, she's an extra on the street in the biblical scene. But she is doing what women have done century after century. She's trying to run her life, she's trying to handle poverty and work, and she's being a mother. And there's something so fantastically physical and interesting about this portrait that I thought it was really worth showing to you. And so that made me consciously think, okay, I want to find out what it was like to be a woman during this period of time. And so the journey I'm going to give you now, very briefly, is what it would have been like if any of the women here had been born 600 years ago. Let's imagine that we're two little girls in this period of time. These are two beautiful paintings, I think you'll probably agree. One's by Bronzini, very powerful painting, portrait painter in the 16th century. This one I bet you haven't seen before, but I think it's great, <coughs> is by a man called Gilalai. He painted that big scene of the women in childbirth, right? And I think you can feel she's probably 12 or 13. She's really got personality there. In fact, she rather reminds me of my younger daughter in some respects. Um, and uh, I, I think it's very, they're very classic because these two girls would have had a reasonably good time up until this moment. And I just have to put a government health warning here because I'm not going to be able to show you much about the life of ordinary working women. That's why that Brancacci Chapel image is so important, because we just don't have the historical records to get in there. But we do know what kind of middle class and upper class girls might have been done. So we're in the middle of the Renaissance, everybody's really interested in humanism and education and the classics. So these girls who are well born would have had a good education, right? They would have been taught how to play music, they would maybe have learned Latin, smattering of Greek, um, sewing, whatever. They would have been cultured young women. And then at the age of 13 or 14, it all changes. And the reason it all changes, because at this moment in time, they will start to menstruate. And as soon as girls start to menstruate, they become sexual temptation. You're taking me right back now to Adam and Eve, right? In the Garden of Eve, in the Garden of Eden, uh, Adam knows he shouldn't eat the apple. Eve goes, come on, try this. He could say, no. <coughs> Thank you, Eve, we can't. He takes it, and it's Eve's fault, right? And that's what you're looking at. Now, Eve moves into history as the temptress. And so, by the time these young girls become temptresses, you have to do something with them to make sure there's going to be no problem. The first and obvious thing to do is you marry them off. And you marry them off, and this is a moment of time when you have to pay for your daughters to be married off, right? You have to provide a dowry for them. And marriages are not, of course, about love. They're about dynastic political unions to keep territory in the same hands. And once you're married, you will probably end up pretty soon pregnant. Because that's, in a sense, your purpose, is now to produce the next set of heirs. Um, and I think it's a very hard thing to try and imagine that that is literally what would happen to you, having been this well-educated young girl, now shoved into a marriage. Almost certainly you won't love your husband. You probably might not even have met him. Lucretia Borgia marries somebody twice her age and they're only introduced on the wedding day. But that is what it was like then. Uh, such was life after you were married. And it's such a fascinating painting. Just read it. This is Venice, right? It's Venice, very proud civic city, okay? Um, and they're having one of their civic ceremonies to show you how important Venice is. And as you can see, there's loads and loads of men uh, here. And look up here. It's all oh, Right, okay. So what you can see there 
is women who have been kept in the house and they're not allowed out on the streets because they wouldn't be respectable if they were. Okay? So that's one of the things that you could do. Your second choice, because it's not a choice at all, because you just set up a breeding cow in this way, is uh, it involves leaving your father's house, it involves money changing hands, and it involves you going to what looks like, oh, no. <laughs> Involves going to what will be a really lovely house, okay? Uh, once you're inside it, you want to run women, it will be beautiful in many ways. Architecturally, it's absolutely dazzling. All of these pictures come from the city of Ferrara, right? But you look a little closer at the architecture, and it's not quite as nice as it seems. What you're looking at is convents. And this is the other central choice or lack of choice that women of reasonable breeding would have had at this moment of time, right? They would have been married off to the only man who would take less money for a dowry if you couldn't get the right man, which is Jesus Christ. And what is really interesting about this moment is on the surface, it looks very like this is the worst possible thing that you could have. Um, think about who's likely to go here. You've got a daughter who's had smallpox, right? I'm not going to be able to sell her off. She's ready for the convent. You've got a daughter who has some mental problems, emotional problems, or oh, she'll cause trouble in marriage. You're, uh, and there's a character in the Renaissance called Isabella Desta who says, Jesus Christ is the only son in law who hasn't caused me any trouble, right? So it's a very convenient place to send your daughter. Uh, we now think that something like a third to a half of all well-born women during, by the middle of the 16th century were in convents. It's really quite a terrifying idea. Um, and yet, there is something going on in these convents which we now know more about. Now, at one level, it's obvious and it's not good, but we never knew about convents before. This is one of the things that feminist history has gone to ask about. Who, who were they, all these people? Well, art doesn't help you because they're either the serried ranks of the beatified, okay, or they're dead, very good dead nun, or they're threatening the unfaithful with crucifix, right? Artists aren't really interested in women who wear wimples, okay? Um, but you start to be able to find extracts from history which tells you something's going on here. So this was a fragment of graffiti found in a prayer book, right, in a 15th century Benedictine convent. My mother wanted me to become a nun to fatten the diary of my sister. But when I spent my first night in my cell, I heard my lover's voice down below. I rushed to the gate, but the mother abbess caught me. Tell me, little sister, she said, do you have a fever or are you in love? So obviously there was tensions going on within these closed houses. This woman is called Marie Celeste, and she is in a convent because her father is Galileo, and she's the illegitimate daughter of Galileo. She's put in the convent because she has a younger sister, also in the convent, who is emotionally disturbed. So she's there to save it. So it's exactly how a family would operate. And I want to read you something that she says in a letter that she writes to Galileo, her father. OK? Thank you. I might need the lights, actually. I hope to be excused for dashing off my last two letters so randomly, Father. But truly, I was half beside myself in terror by a novice mistress who was overpowered by those moods of hers. She tried twice in recent days to kill herself. The first time she struck her head and face against the ground with such force that she has become monstrously deformed. The second time she stabbed herself 13 times, leaving two wounds in her throat, two in her stomach and others in her abdomen. She is now tied to her bed, albeit with the same deliriums 
and we continue to live in fear of some new outburst. That's one letter from one nun in one convent that has been preserved because her father is famous. So you can see that when you lift up this stone, there's an incredible amount going on underneath. We now know that there are some women who complained. Oh, how weary it is to find myself always sitting at the same table with the same food. How tormenting to retire every night to the same bed and always to breathe the same air. Always to conduct the same conversations, to see the same faces. This is a Venetian nun called Angelo Tarabotti, who lives her entire life in this now consecrated convent, but in Venice. She has a limp, which is why she was not married off, and this is where she ends up. And she writes, she writes a great deal about her experiences. Of course, they're not published to way after her death, but she really puts her finger on it. Among men's blameworthy access, his private place was going to be closing innocent women within convent walls under apparently holy but really wicked pretexts. They forced women to dwell in lifelong prisons, although guilty of no fault other than being born the weaker sex. So I'm writing a novel set in a convent at this time, and I'm starting to think, God, I can't write this. I'm so angry. These women had no choice. How do I try and enter their experience? <laughs> and then I suddenly realized that, of course, what I'm trying to do is write from their perspective when I'm a 21st century woman, where I've had choice. And I start to think, if I go back into their lives, what was their other choice? There was no other choice. It was being the breeding cow and getting married. And the more I look into it, the more I start to realize that convents which had all women in them could also almost contradictorily be a place with some freedoms attached to it. So for instance, this is a painting of a nun who is working in a dispensary, okay? No woman could become a doctor outside at this moment of time, but those women were all together. They're in a republic of women. Some of them are going to get sick. Somebody has to look after them. So one of the nuns would have been allowed to study medicine, allowed to have a herb garden. Oh, right, I see something's going on that I didn't realize. These are paintings that the abbess has commissioned. This is a, a fabulous artist called Andrea de Sarto, a Florentine artist of the early 16th century. And we know, because we've got the documentation, that she actually bargains him down to 40 florins for both of these to be painted and be in the convent. They are writing plays. We know that novices perform plays dressed up as men and women on feast days. They are illustrating manuscripts, not as much as nuns, but they're in there. They're doing scholastic study. Suddenly, this republic of women has got quite a lot of creativity going on in it. And in one particular case, they are painting. This is a painting by a nun called Plautilla Nelly. She goes into a Florentine convent at the age of eight. She teaches herself to paint from the sketchbooks of a painter called San Bartolomeo. And she is the only woman for the first 250 years who will ever complete a picture of the Last Supper. When they found it, it didn't look good. It had come out of the uh, convent where she lived and died as abbess. It had been rolled up in the storeroom, and about three or four years ago, crowdfunding went out in order to restore it. And this is what it looked like when it was finished. Right? The woman knew what she was doing. Okay? Look at the detail in this. She never actually, she's probably seen the odd workman coming into the convent, but other than that, this has been the life that she's led. But actually, she is able to capture it. She, even in this convent in Florence, runs a school where she trains some of the nuns to produce little images of St. Catherine, which they can sell, you know, to augment the economy of the convent. So strangely, what looks like a horror story unexpectedly becomes something that is actually much more interesting. And there's one more thing that goes on in the convent, and I just want you to listen to it.
sing eight times during the day because there were services and you sang the psalms and the lyrics. <coughs> but actually within these convents there were extraordinary choirs of women growing up. Though the music that you just heard is done by a group who have recreated the sound that nuns would have sounded like. They found actually manuscripts with some of the stuff there and they've performed them themselves. And what they've discovered is that not just nuns singing, and singing very well, which would be an immense emotional release if you're there the whole time, right? But some really powerful single singers are in there. They've got a convent mistress who's transposing all of the music that's been written in Italy for female voices. They've got convent mistresses who are writing their own stuff, writing polyphony. You will not have heard of them, but we now know who they are. We're putting out recordings of the music that they composed. So it is really amazing what's going on there. If you were a very religious little girl, which obviously some of them were, because so obviously the only game in town, and there's great sensitivity and power to having a relationship to Christ, you could actually become something even more powerful. You could become a visionary. You could decide that your relationship to God was so important that that's who you were in the world. This is a much later image, but those of you doing any art history will recognize it. It's by Bernini, and it's the ecstasy of Santa Teresa, right? Here she is, the angel coming down and piercing her heart with God's love. This great story in Rome, it's in Rome, of a French aristocrat who sees this and says, well, if that is spiritual ecstasy, I have had it many times. <laughs> so you, you can see how confusing it is. But these young women who became visionaries uh, gained a lot of power because they could prophesy. Yeah. So it's a sculpture. It's a sculpture. Sorry. Yes, it's a sculpture. Benini is a fantastic sculptor, right? But he's about 150 years later. Okay. And these young women would become so holy that people would come and visit them because they would prophesy. They would often have stigmata. They would live on the host only. There's a lot of work to be done in the relationship of these very young women, 13, 14, not eating, being very spiritually intoxicated with forms of anorexia now, which is a very big conversation going on between historians. But if you were really holy and you did the job, you would be remembered even in death. Unfortunately, this would be your semi-ruined body, which you would have preserved because you were that famous. Um, so there is immortality, right? So there you've got it. You've got marriage and you've got the convent. There's one other thing that women could do during this period of time. And for that, I want you to say the idea of lying down. <laughs> do you know this painting? It's by Titian, it's the Venus of Urbino. And you know that this woman was a courtesan, right? And this is one job women get to do throughout the ages, wherever you walk into it, okay? Uh, so she's a high-class sex worker. She's not a prostitute. Her clients will all be quite rich, she'll be quite high up in governments. And we know that he paints her because there is a series of letters between him and somebody saying, you know, her name is Angela Zavetti. And the reason that this is such an interesting portrait is because up until this moment of time, although the Renaissance is starting to add female naked bodies, not just Eve or Mary Magdalene, they're starting to celebrate the female body and celebrate the female nude. Up until this moment of time, every image you'll see of a naked woman will either be, I'm just washing my hair so you can't see me, I'm just looking in the mirror, I'm just a scene. Whereas this woman is looking directly at you. So she is the, the first example of, uh, in Christianity, post-Christianity, of a naked woman engaging with what would almost certainly have been a male gaze. And I think it's an incredible moment because I think you really do see that women did have some agency, even if it didn't last very long if you were a courtesan. He will go on to paint her, Titian is fascinated by her beauty, and he will go on to paint her in very beautiful ways. Um, interestingly, she's wearing pearls. Pearls is a symbol of purity. 
she's actually defying the law by wearing the pearls because the Venetians want to keep the courtesans off the street. But one of the ways they show themselves off is by going to church and appearing there so they might get new clients. So they have... The problem with being a courtesan is it took a lot of work, right? Uh, this is a wonderful painting in the National Gallery, and I bring it to you because I want to show you how the history of art changes. When the National Gallery gets this painting <coughs> in the mid-19th century, she looks like this, right? She's been painted to be demure and fitting in with the kind of morals of Victoriana. And when we restore her, what we get is this, which is so clearly to me a courtesan, because I happen to know that one of the things that courtesans do when they arrive in a new town is they throw themselves open at the window. You remember all those women at the top of the windows? And they're used to looking up to see the windows. You see this lovely thing at the window. It's a form of advertising, right? So then you knock on the door, you ask if they're new in town, and the mother says, often the mother's running it, would you like to come to dinner? And the rest is history because she's got a new client. But I think it shows you that the blonde hair, most of the time it's dark, right? The beautiful skin, which means you've never been in the sun, the rose by the lips, it shows you what a lot of work it takes to be a beautiful woman at any time, according to the fashions, but very particularly at this moment. And I want to read you um, a very brief um, extract from in this book, I'm afraid I wrote it, but I'll do it fast. Uh, because I did a lot of research into what it took to look like this if you were living at this moment of time. And this is basically it. On Thursday, this is written from the perspective of a male dwarf who is the major role who runs the, um, the, the sort of business side of this courtesan who lives in Venice. On Thursdays, my lady takes her visitors as she is busy about her beauty. She wakes late and washes her hair. Her maid soaks and then massages her scalp with a cedar paste to encourage new growth before rinsing it twice in water made from boiled vine stock with barley straw, crushed licorice root and lemon to encourage the blonde streaks. She then sits with her back to the open window for the sun to continue dyeing her hair while her maid plucks her eyebrows and hairline so that her forehead is high and clear. The apothecary arrives at lunchtime with a special bleaching paste which is applied to her face and neck and shoulders. Its ingredients, I have heard, include mercury, dove's entrails, camphor and egg white. But in what proportions and with what other refinements, I have no idea that such information is as guarded as any state secret. When the mask is removed, an hour glass is too long, half is too short, my lady's skin can be a little blotchy from it, so it must be soothed with cucumber water and warm towels. She then cleans her teeth with a stick doused in rosemary, rubs her gums with mint, and treats her eyes with a water of witch hazel to highlight the white. She has her maid dress her and lightly powder her skin, which is now white but smooth as unveiled marble. In the great Venice ship factory known as the Arsenale, we tell stories of how a canal is bounded by storehouses on either side, manned by hundreds of workers, and how when a vessel is to be launched, it moves slowly through this wet dock, and at every stage, through its windows and onto the deck, it's kitted out. Cordage, mortars, gunpowder, arms, oars, hourglasses, compasses, maps, provisions, wine, fresh bread. In this way, within a single working day, the great Venetian galley is made ready for the sea. I think sometimes of this our smaller business when I watch my lady constructing herself, because in a way we too fit out a vessel, all of us equally committed and focused on its demands. So there you have the three things that you could be as a woman. Uh, you could be married, you could be uh, a nun, or you could be a courtesan. I think it's representative of the extraordinary moment of history which is called the Renaissance, which ought to be a freeing for all, but is really mostly only a freeing for half the population. But little by little, of course, the endless march of feminism will work. So suddenly women will be able to appear outside of the memory, they will be able to sing, they will be able to be involved in other things. And it will take you maybe about 60 years for you to get 
to this image. And this is a painting by Artemita Gentileschi, whose father was a painter, right? So she learns from him, and who uh, captures herself, because she always paints herself, in the self-portrait where she's playing the loop, which is what all exams do. She's showing how attractive she is, so there's a statement that she's always making herself the courtesan, and she is directly engaging you with her eyes. She's, in a sense, challenging the male gaze. And I think that the other thing you want to know about this picture is it is only in the last 30 years that we have really taken seriously an artist like Artemisia Gentileschi. We just didn't know about her before. The first piece I've ever read about her was in the 1990s. So that is literally a revolution that has taken place in history which allows us to see this room differently. And I'm stopping now. That's it. Please, if you have questions, ask. they thought was going to do the trick, and pulped mare's kidneys. 
Now, if you are, have studied science, what you may well know is the original contraceptive pill came from an element of mare's urine because it contains estrogen. So very ironically, they have come across or alighted on, this happens a lot during this period, you go into the apothecaries and you realize that they're using herbs in a way that actually we would now recognize from aspirin on because they've got the original herbs. And that's it. And also, just in terms of bringing it up to date, abortion is not looked on in the same way. You know, we're now having a major political row about abortion. It was perfectly acceptable, as long as you didn't talk about it too much, to abort. There were things that women could take and do in order not to have children. Uh, they would often breastfeed for you know, a year or two because it was supposed to suppress um, their hormones. So they're very, they're, very, they're very aware of the problem. It's just there's not a great deal they can do about it. But I love that courtesan's cocktail of holy water and estrogen. Mm -hmm. Yes, then there and there. Um, what if a woman got married and then attempted to be like a painter or a writer or a scientist while being in the marriage? Because obviously the husband would be able to do whatever he was doing, would there not be an option to just secretly do something and get it out? And yeah, and you do find examples of it actually. I'm thinking of one woman, Victoria Colonna, who has a very bad relationship with her husband actually, but her husband rather conveniently dies and she writes the most wonderful poems, all about what a wonderful man he was, which was clearly untrue, but it allows her to write wonderful poems. And she will actually get those poems published, the first woman to have poems published. So you can do some writing. It, it, Isabella Deste, who um, is one of another character, and she's the first female patron, has her own studio, her own little room, where she commissions art and where she studies but she gets a lot of flack for it. So sometimes you have to do it underneath the radar. And of course it depends on your relationship to your husband. I mean, it's interesting, you go back into history and you think, well, men and women must still have had relationships, you know. They must have got on with each other. They must have recognized that women had intelligence and extraordinary capacities. That's a relationship. It's just you don't see it in the arts and the literature. But I think a lot is going on underneath. Yeah. Um, what would happen to women, women whose husbands died? Would they get remarried or would they... Uh, it's, it's very interesting. In fact, it's very convenient if your husband dies because you keep the dowry so you're independent. And because almost always you will be married at 14 or 15 to an older man, it's quite likely that he will die. So you find a lot of women with their dowries becoming sort of semi now. They'll go and live on the outskirts of the convent, and they'll give money to the convent, and they'll get involved in the culture of it. Um, it is almost impossible for you to live alone as a woman of a good family, so you find ways to do it. I, I never find women eager to remarry. I think they've really realized when they become uh, widowed that this is quite a good position for them to be in, <coughs> because it allows them much more freedom. Publicly, how were courtesans viewed, and also were they talked about, or was it like sort of? Yeah, yeah, they are. You know, the really shocking thing about courtesans is the culture begins in Rome, and it begins in Rome because that's where the Catholic Church is. Okay, so the whole central government and organisation of the Catholic Church, which is all about keeping the money in the church which has brought in laws to say that if you become part of the administration of the Catholic Church, you can't get married. You have to take a vow of celibacy, i.e. not to marry. For the women, if you take a vow of celibacy, that means celibacy in all of its end. For the men, it doesn't seem to include chastity, right? So what you discover is that there are bishops and popes and cardinals who have mistresses. Uh, and because those people cannot possibly go into the streets and have sex with a prostitute, common or garden, not least because syphilis is just arriving in the culture and is a terrible, deadly disease, um, you need somebody that looks more like your own class. And these courtesans will probably not, they won't come from the upper class, but they will come often with their mother who's been a courtesan. 
They will have been reasonably well educated, they'll be beautiful, clearly, they'll be smart, and they will be discreet. So they'll have a house with a number of clients and they'll entertain them and then at a certain point they'll go into the back room but there'll be a diary and you know who else is coming in when. And what's really interesting when you study them is for a period of time they really do seem to crack it, right? You can see their houses are beautiful, they've got good art, they know how to dress and then what happens, oh, of course, is they're no longer as young as they were. And so then you see, and this is one of the things that historians have done, you see that their wills involve times when they had to pawn objects that they owned because they were <coughs> poor. Um, so once again, these are stories teased out now that we didn't know before, but they're there. Lady Anne. Can you talk about um, how often people answer mothers? Yes. And we know that there are young rent boards 
operating in France, and we know it because it's a police force that comes in and arrests them, and we know about the punishments. The crime, you have your nose cut off because it will spoil your beauty. Because if you're the recipient of penetration, i.e. gay in that way, you're perceived as the woman, the prostitute. You're the vulnerable one, so you're seen as it. When it comes to women, there's not even a word for it, okay? But what you do find in convents is you find abbesses who write the rules and suggest that it would be very good if there wasn't too much very close female friendship going on at certain points during the um, novices when they get together. And there's one particular case, and um, it, there's a film of it, and I can't remember the title of it, it's a dreadful film, it's not a good historian, about a case which comes up before the Inquisition where a woman who claims to be a visionary is proved not to be a visionary because she's faked the stigmata. <coughs> and she is in a cell with a younger woman. And the suggestion is that they are clearly lovers. But when the woman who is the younger woman testifies, in order to kind of cope with the horror of what she's being asked to describe, what she says is, well, I would lay down on the bed, and then the mother superior would come over to me, but then she would turn into the archangel Michael and lay on top of me. Right, right so, so it's first of all, she knows she can't tell the truth, but also maybe she can't quite tell the truth to herself. And that's always what you're dealing with when you go into these moments of time. Are they saying what they think they should say? Or are they saying what they truly believed because it was too difficult to say what was really happening? Because they would have been the wise old women in the village, right? 
I mean, the history of like childbirth is women do it all the time until men decide that's quite a good job, so let's get in and take it over from the women. I just want to say, I do really like men. I don't really like men. But this is literally what happens. So I think there was folklore where women knew stuff. And I certainly think in the convents which I studied, they had their own herb gardens. So they knew what they were doing, and some of them have their own distillers, so they can actually distill remedies. But just like everything else in the places, people are asking questions. They're having new, you know, Vesalius is, um, up until this moment, they would decide that the Greeks do everything, so they take their version of it. And then when they actually get into the human body, they think, oh no, it's not like this actually. Actually, Gallon, he was dissecting a pig, and a pig doesn't have a heart like a man. So there's leaps being taken. So I think women would have always been involved in medicine at some quiet level. And I think within something like a common, they became the equivalent of the doctors. I think we could talk about a